Following recent deaths around the nation of African Americans by law enforcement, the Black Lives Matter movement became a unified voice, applauded by some, criticized by others. Tanya Faison of Black Lives Matter Sacramento and attorney and professor Mark T. Harris of the Law Enforcement Accountability Directive join us to separate myth and misunderstanding from reality, next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. We are in Sacramento, the capital of diversity. Why do we need Black Lives Matter in Sacramento? That's a really big question. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of inequality in Sacramento. Um, we have the police are killing folks at a really high rate locally, Sacramento PD and the Sacramento Sheriff. We've lost quite a few people just in the last eight months. The police are killing people at a high rate in Sacramento. Yes. What are the statistics? Um, I think it's been about five people in the last eight months. Um, and it's two of them were by SAC PD, two of them were by Sacramento Sheriff. Um, actually, three of them were by Sacramento Sheriff. And then CHP tased somebody and tried to kill them. Tried to the kill implication them. Is, is that all of these were deaths that were unnecessary, un unprovoked and uncalled for. Yes. That's your position? Definitely. All right. What exactly, mm -hmm. Professor Harris, is LEAD? LEAD's an organization that came together out of necessity. Uh, it, interestingly, with the shooting of uh, a gentleman in the Del Paso Heights section of Sacramento. And incidentally, do you corroborate uh, Ms. Faison's uh, perspective? I, I, I do. I mean, this is supposed to be the land of diversity. You stated as such both the state but also Sacramento. Sacramento is supposed to be the div most diverse city in America. Diversity didn't have anything to do with it. What we should have is accountability. What we should have is a certain level of transparency in terms of how law enforcement is making its decisions, particularly its lethal decisions. There should be an openness and there should be a transparency that everyone in Sacramento should be calling for. No one should take issue with that. The, the but to say that there, are, there is a problem mm -hmm. that it needs to be addressed, mm -hmm. is this a recent phenomenon that somehow has just manifested itself over the past year or so since we've seen this, na this national outcry? No. In Sacramento, there's been plenty of deaths over the last couple decades in Sacramento, mm -hmm. um, but people are paying attention now because mm -hmm. of the controversies that are happening across the country. Um, folks are seeing these deaths and um, now we're starting to pay attention to what's happening locally and we're trying to call it out and see some transparency from our police and we're not getting anything. And when you say you're not getting anything, give us an example of the transparency that you're seeking that, that you don't feel that the community is receiving. Um, Adrian Ludd and Dejan Flannel were both killed by law enforcement in Sacramento. Adrian Ludd was killed in October of last year. Dejan was killed April of this year. Um, both of those families have yet to see mm. a police report or an autopsy report just so that they can try to get justice because they can't. What were, the, what were the circumstances behind the deaths? Um, the circumstances based on what the police are saying or what? Well, I, I, well I, what would the police say if they were here in terms of the reason that the, the, these individuals were killed? With Adrian Ludd, they tried to say, they originally stated that he got out of the car shooting at police and that, or sheriff deputies. They said that one of the officers was, officers was grazed by a bullet. Scott Jones, who's our elected sheriff, he went out on the scene and gave that story to the media. He talked to folks that had witnessed it and they all gave the same story after they spoke with each other. And then the next day the story changed that the gun was jammed. Um, and then another story came out that he came out of his car went around the car while, while they went, he went around the car to the back seat of the passenger side to get this gun that didn't work. Um, and then when he was laying on the ground dead, he was reaching for this gun. So there's just a lot of inconsistencies 
Um, and this is all while he did have a working gun in his pocket. So if he did want to do something like that, he wouldn't have had to run around the car to the back seat to get some gun that didn't work. And where are we at on, uh, on in the process on investigating these deaths? Well, there are a couple of things. So as a matter of full disclosure, I'm part of the legal team representing the Mann family. He was the gentleman I mentioned who was shot and killed in the Del Paso Heights section of Sacramento. Let me give you the facts as the police first conveyed what happened and then the reality that our video has shown and hopefully that the dash cam video that law enforcement has taken will show. The report that first went out is there was a gentleman with a, with a gun and a knife who was uh, engaged in activity that caused alarm in the community. Now, I've been in Del Paso Heights a long time, as you well know. I was the president of a company that was located on Del Paso Boulevard. I go to Calvary Christian Church right on Del Paso as it becomes Marysville Boulevard. I've been in and around that neighborhood quite a bit. It's very rare that someone would call the police and report somebody under those circumstances. But we'll take that as a, as a position uh, consistent with what the police report said. I was at home coincidentally when this went down and the noon news on the day that this happened said a report ongoing right now is a circumstance in Sacramento, North Sacramento, with a, a shooter, with an active shooter. One officer down injured. The officer who was down, it turned out, was down from jumping out of his car and he injured himself. The way it was reported by the media and the way the police reported it to the media was that the inference, the very strong inference, is somehow this gentleman, the decedent, had brought about the injury to the officer. Nothing could be further from the truth. So they even had a camera crew stationed outside a UC Davis hospital where the officer was almost on a vigil-like basis relative to him being a victim of violence. That's not what happened. The report went on to say that the gentleman who was shot and killed was approaching the officers in a menacing way, brandishing a knife, a long knife. The video that we got our hands on and quite honestly have shown on our website, anyone is able to, to, to take a look at and download it from our website, shows the gentleman had absolutely no weapon. He was karate chopping the air and speaking incoherently. The gentleman was a victim of mental illness. And our belief is that that's not the way anyone in Sacramento would want to see a mentally ill relative or a mentally ill associate or any mentally ill person treated. Shot, 18 rounds of bullets were fired at this gentleman, 16 which penetrated his body. There is no way, on, on, as far as I'm concerned, as far as we're concerned, that that's justified on any basis. Let's take a step back from individual cases and go more to the moment in time that mm -hmm. we're at. Mm -hmm as a society. What is it that your organization seeks to illuminate here within this region that you and your colleagues don't feel is getting enough attention? Mm. Um, we are basically fighting for black liberation which means that we want to be free. Um, and so in Sacramento specifically the issues that that are present are overwhelming. Um, right now we've been focusing on gentrification. Um, it's really far gone in Oak Park and so we've been trying to make sure that the folks that live in Oak Park that are people of color that have lived there for years and years their voices are being heard because a lot of them have been displaced. A lot of businesses have been moved out so we're bringing attention to that um, and that's one of the things that people weren't talking about until we started talking about it. Um, but let me, mm -hmm. let me ask you a question with all, with all due respect. Mm -hmm. We started out talking about violence mm -hmm. and, and deaths of African American men. And you're bringing up the issue of gentrification and without making a value judgment on it. Mm -hmm. It seems like the two are really disconnected. Mm -hmm. Where's the relationship? between the two? Well, violence comes in different shapes. Um, gentrification, it displaces people, and so there's a lot of homeless folks because mm. of that. And right now what you're seeing in Sacramento is a lot of criminalizing of the homeless. Um, so people that are sleeping on the street are getting citations and mm. then getting arrested for falling asleep in public because there's a city ordinance that makes that illegal. Um, those, a lot of those folks that are getting cited and arrested are folks of color. Um, and then you've got folks like Joseph Mann and mm. Dejan Flena who are homeless, mm. mentally ill, and being killed by the police. Can so I say, it's can all I say related. about that, Scott? So today, sure. it just so happens that I was uh, downtown walking. Typically, I drive into my office 
uh, and drive out, just as many, many people do uh, every day uh, of their lives. But today I decided to get out and walk, trying to get my step count up, Tanya. So I decided to get out and walk. And one of the things I saw was exactly what you're talking about. Everywhere you turn, there were homeless people. There were people who were clearly mentally ill. One guy, and, and the sad thing about it is we're all accepting it now like that's normal behavior. We're all, we're all seeing it but not seeing it. If you go at any given moment on any given day to downtown Sacramento, go to Cesar Chavez Park and you'll see the homeless there. Walk up and down J Street, one of the main arterials in this city, and you'll see countless homeless people, countless mentally ill people who are there and are behaving in a way that would cause some to be alarmed. Law enforcement aren't supposed to be among the group that are alarmed by that behavior. Law enforcement is supposed to be trained to recognize when a person has some level of mental instability, and they're supposed to de-escalate a situation as opposed to build it up. Let me, uh, let's again move back from the direct and, and go more to, from a policy mm -hmm. perspective. Your organization is called Law Enforcement Accountability Directive. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is it that your organization, which is separate from Black Lives Matter, but related? Uh, we're what cousins. is it? What We're is cousins. it? What is it that you seek to achieve? Uh, this, uh, the the uh, the reduction in the assassination and unjustified killing of African American people, particularly African American males. So as much as we appreciate that the community is broader than just African American males, this is first and foremost an African American male issue. It's African American males, both here in Sacramento and throughout the country, who are being terminated. Uh, with reckless abandon by so law So I have to ask you the question, sure. Professor Harris, mm -hmm. because the people at home will want to know. Yes. Okay. Don't white lives matter too? All lives matter. Black lives matter equally. I'm unapologetically black. And as far as I'm concerned, it's, un it's, it's not usual in most people's mind to see someone, as we'd say, borrowing from good old Snoop Dogg, suited and booted the way I am, pinstripe suit, former investment banker, former Clinton official, talking about this the way that I am, I'm completely passionate about it because we've gone beyond the point that we, that any citizen should stand by the wayside and allow this kind of travesty to It is to kind of interesting um, mm -hmm. to, uh, that you're involved in this because mm -hmm. you are the former Deputy Chief of Staff to the Commerce Secretary of the United States. Yes. You're the former Under Secretary of Business, Transportation and Housing. Mm -hmm. You are the system. Right. So what the hell are you doing on this side of this argument. Because when I'm not dressed like this, I'm dressed like countless other African American males in usually a pair of flip flops, some baggy shorts, a t-shirt and a cap. And I've been in quotes mistaken for the enemy by, by law enforcement both here in Sacramento and in other parts of the country. And I have two African American male sons. And the bottom line is that if it can happen to one, it can happen to all. And this is, we're going, we've gone way beyond the time of thinking that just living in a gated community and just driving a certain car and just having a certain degree and just dressing a certain way is going to somehow insulate one from the same kind of travesty that happened to the Mann family and the assassination of Joseph Ms. Mann. Ms. Faison, again, uh, your colleague here would uh, ostensibly represent the establishment. And the establishment for the folks that typically deal, have dealt with these issues have been names like the NAACP and Urban League and all those folks. They all still exist. Mm -hmm. Why does this region, why does this country need your movement at this point? Because of that. <laughs> um, everybody's going to fight for this cause however they're going to fight for it and we welcome all fights because it's going to take one of these things that makes it end or all of them all together. Our group fills a void in Sacramento. Um, we basically, just like you said, we're unapologetically black as well. We're fighting for liberation. We're mm. not part of the system. We don't want to be a part of the system. We are solely focused on... By implication, are those established civil rights organizations, have they gotten to a stage where they've been co-opted and they're part of the system? Um, the Can only, they actually advocate? The only one that I could really say that I know a lot about is the NAACP and I feel like they can advocate a little bit harder than they do. They don't advocate like they should, and they have become a little bit systemic in how they, how they navigate, and especially locate, uh, here directly in Sacramento. It leads to a question mm -hmm. about the entire Black Lives Matter movement, which has really been driven by the millennials. And the, the, the millennials 
it appears, are somewhat outraged by the circumstances that, that have presented themselves over the past year. Mm -hmm. and why is it that this particular movement seems to be really driven so much by young people mm -hmm. rather than the organizations that were established originally to fight this fight? In my experience, um, I can only speak from that because I think it comes from a combination of things, but in my experience, um, you see a lot of older folks have a more passive attitude toward what's going on. Um, you see a lot of respectability. It's where people think that if you dress a certain way or if you carry yourself a certain way, then you won't face these issues. But if you look at the past at the different people that have been killed by police, Tamir Rice, um, folks, you could be a doctor, you could be, mm -hmm. your pants could be up around your waist, it does not matter, it's not going to save you. Mm. And so that's where we're at now. We're at a place where we want to, you know, society has expected black folks for decades to assimilate to a society. Mm -hmm. And right now we're at a point where we need them to assimilate to us, accept us in all of our dreadlocks, all of our gold teeth, all mm. of our sagging pants, mm. and just accept us as humans because every race of folks in this country is doing the same thing that we're doing. They're adopting it and they're actually getting compliments for it. They're not having to cut off their dreadlocks so that they could live. Um, and so we just want to be accepted as we are and we want society to just stop killing us. <laughs> what is the role of non-black people in this movement? Or is there one? There's a huge role for people that are not, people that benefit from the system need to be the ones that demolish it. And um, every, you know, it's, we're going to continue to fight for our freedom. Um, and those of those, those of the folks that are awake and- I want, I want mm -hmm. to pause on what you just said. Okay. The, you said the people that benefit from the system mm -hmm. are the people that need to demolish it. Right. You have an audience right now. Mm -hmm. What do you say to all those people that are watching us right now? Mm. What is it that you want them to do? You have privilege. You have privilege because of your skin color. Don't accept that privilege. Fight it. When it comes and it's, it's given to you, stand up against it and call it out and continue to call it out and fight it until it's gone. Professor Harris, give us some context. How did we get here? Ooh, because uh, we pulled up early. I think we actually pulled up early, and there's so many different ways we could talk about that contextually and historically. But even before that, taking it all the way back, America's never acknowledged or apologized uh, for the, the absolute abhorrent behavior of uh, the founding fathers and mothers of this country. I just read in the New York Times an article which referred to um, Georgetown University now carving out a special pathway for black students, a different kind of affirmative action descendants of slaves recognizing that slaves built Georgetown University. The first lady of the United States, God bless her, said something I'll never forget at the Democratic National Convention. She said, I sleep in a house that was built by slaves. And there were all kinds of cynical, sarcastic comments that were made about her comment. The recognition at the highest levels of the American government that those words that, that ring true for some Americans don't ring true for all Americans. And then you do go classic civil rights. If one injustice affects one person, it affects everybody. That's the message that I think Tanya and I agree on. So whether it's ACT here in Sacramento or the NAACP or Black Lives Matter Sacramento or LEAD, all of us are trying to strive for the same goal, and that is truth and honor and integrity. The, the very principles that this country espouses, we want this country to live up to its lofty goals and ideals. When you talk about goals, mm -hmm. you all have an agenda. What is it? Um, we're, we're going to fight structural racism at every level, um, whether it be in education, healthcare, um, whatever, you know, each chapter is in a different location and each location has different issues that are specific to their region. And so here in Sacramento, like I said, gentrification, education, police brutality, and I mean, we've been talking about police murder, but there's also police brutality mm. and that's not documented. Um, and there's a lot of folks. I've been harassed by the police, um, you know, a couple of times throughout my life. So we're just trying to make sure that people are heard, that issues get addressed, and that we, um, we really want to get rid of 
all of the all of the entities that are put in place with a history of racism for example the police um, they were created as slave catchers and so they have that history and throughout history they've kept certain aspects to their to their um, to their structure that go along with how they started and so we really want to make it so that um, all of our civil servants servants are governed by the community instead of by the system they, they need to be more accountable. Recently we had on uh, the head of training mm. for the sheriff's department and uh, the this this officer told us that they spend an inordinate amount of time on training to ensure that uh, the way that they interact with the public, all of the public, is consistent and predictable. Mm. What would you say to, uh, and, oh, and that if you comply in your engagement with an officer, you have nothing to fear. Now, that's not exactly what he said, that's, mm. that's my paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that individual in response? I would say that there's plenty of instances where folks have complied and they're not here today. Um, and as far as training, um, it's important, but the Sacramento Sheriff Department is one of the most, their, their elected official has gotten caught numerous times for doing things illegally, and he gets off every time, and now he's running for Congress. Um, but, but specifically, I, I have to ask you this. Mm -hmm. It's a big leap to say that. What's your evidence to support the connection between any other set of behaviors related to him and the issue of how it is that his troops underneath his command interact with the public? Well, leadership is important. When you have someone leading and setting the example for his deputies, then he's going to set the tone for that department. And when he listens to 500 calls through a stingray machine illegally and gets caught and gets away with it, then that sets the What's a, a stingray machine? Stingray is a device that's used to listen to cell phone, t cell phone calls. He got caught in 2010 doing that. Um, it's documented in the media. Um, so that's just one thing. Without, permi so Without you're permission. Saying, you're saying that this is a violation of law? Yes. He got, he got in trouble, but basically he told them he wouldn't do it anymore. He would get warrants going forward. Um, and so he was let, you know, let off the hook for that. So, um, and it brings it back to accountability and transparency. Mm -hmm. If we have, you know, if, if a police officer does something that's not right, then instead of making it right and making the story, shaping the story around the incident so that they get away with it, punish them. Get rid of officers that kill people. Get rid of officers that have numerous complaints. There's an officer that, or a sheriff a deputy that beat up a guy in the middle of the street over there off of Fulton. And he had numerous complaints against him for being violent towards people. And it came out in the media after this happened. But that wouldn't have happened if it was taken care of in advance. What is LEAD's agenda, separate and distinct from Black Lives Matter? Very simple. To reduce the number of African American males who are being shot and killed by law enforcement. Uh, uh, Tell us how. Well, very. we have 12 points that we have presented to the Run city. Run through them quickly. I'm not going to go through all 12. They're on our website, but I'll give you the highlights if you don't mind. One of them is that the police accountability function that the city of Sacramento has right now in the person of one individual who answers to the city manager and has all of her resources provided by the city of Sacramento, that should be a different process. There should be an independence, there should be an autonomy, there should be an independent budget. The person who that person hires, those persons who are the team who are going to actually investigate ought to be empowered to do their job. People have said, so do you mean that they then become the surrogate for the mayor and the city council? Absolutely not. But I know right now you've got a city manager who's no one elect, who no one has elected who's making decisions in this space. You've got a city attorney who no one has elected making decisions in this space. You have an absolutely impotent police commission in Sacramento that needs to just be disbanded. What's not your fixed. evidence that they're that they're impotent? Uh, real simple. How many allegations have been brought before that body, and how many folks have gone through that process and been found guilty of what? the allegations have been. They haven't even investigated fully. They're not set up for doing that. Mm -hmm. Their meetings up to this point have been uh, a pat on the back session among one another. 
uh, in my opinion, and our opinion as an organization, there needs to be a complete independence in order for the community to have confidence in the um, investigatory and um, the processes associated with making recommendations as to what should happen if someone is found um, on the wrong side of whatever the policies and procedures of the police department are. Back half a tick, though. In Stockton, California, not 40 miles down the road from here, there's a police chief who I embrace completely. I know a lot of people say, You're, you are embracing a police chief? Absolutely. Here's why. This gentleman says the system is broken in terms of how we even recruit law enforcement officers. We need to, we need to recruit those who have church service, community service, who have already shown a propensity to be actively engaged and involved in something other than cracking heads and trying to, uh, if you will, inappropriately assort, assert the authority of the state. And we're going to leave it there. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests, and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.